Now, from Wish TV, your local news source. This is All Indiana Politics. Good Sunday morning. Welcome to another edition of All Indiana Politics. I'm Phil Sanchez. The primary field now set for this year's municipal elections. Here in Indianapolis, political commentator Abdul Hakim Shabazz has joined a field of Republicans looking to upset Democrat Mayor Joe Hogsett. He spoke with our government reporter, Garrett Berquist. Let's welcome in Abdul Hakim Shabazz. Abdul, thank you for dropping by. Hey, my pleasure to be here today. Always happy to talk to the, you guys in the audience. Why are you running for mayor of Indianapolis? That's a very good question, because my wife asked me that same question recently. Like, honey, why do you want to do this? Like, why do you want a job where people call you all day and complain about their problems? Like, well, sweetie, I've been a radio talk show host for almost 20 years, so that's all people did was call and complain about, you know, their problems and their issues. Uh, no, but seriously, after writing about being in Indianapolis since 2004, writing about crime, writing about infrastructure, I thought it was time to sort of stop talking about it, maybe take a step forward, maybe start doing something about it. I've seen good leadership in the city. I've seen poor leadership in the city. I think I can make a difference. What's your plan to bring down the city's murder rate? You said that's your number one priority. The first thing I do is convene a meeting with the Marion County Prosecutor, the Public Defender, the Chief Judges, and everyone else in our public safety community. Like, hey guys, there's a difference between people we're mad at and people we're afraid of. People we're mad at, let's look at some alternative form of sentencing to, to get them back on track. People we're afraid of, they need to go. And they need to go away for a while. Because if you look at the data, uh, anywhere from 60 to 70 percent, almost sometimes it's 80 percent, of murder victims and suspects have a prior adult felony. Whether it's, adult, whether it's a felony for crime against a person, weapons, drugs. So why are these people with prior felonies out? I mean, we said we have that revolving door uh, with our bail system. And if someone, I was gonna say, if somebody just uh, murder, was released on bail for murder, and they got it up, like, no, they, they were arrested for murder, charged with murder, pending charges, and then they end up getting a second crime, they're like $150 bail. That's, that's ridiculous. Now, granted, everyone's entitled to due process. As an attorney, I understand that, and I know that. But once again, there are people we're mad at versus people we're afraid of. And Indianap Indiana should be, and Indianapolis, Mary County should be, the worst place to commit a crime, best place to get a second chance, but not the best place to get a third, fourth, or fifth chance. What are some diversion programs you would like to see you for, as you put it, the people we're mad at? For nonviolent, first time offenders, then I think what we can do is like, hey, as part of your probation, we're going to send you to school to get an education, to get a certificate, to get an associate's degree. A, it's cheaper than jail. Ivy Tech, because I teach at Ivy Tech, and Ivy Tech is a whole lot cheaper than jail. Education is basically free in a nutshell. And so by putting them on the, sort of that track, I think we, we can solve our crime issue and, and, and greatly reduce our crime problem. Now, some folks maybe in the audience may be saying, well, look, Abdul, you're saying if somebody commits a crime, they should get a free college education? Like, no, I'm not saying that. What, what I am saying is, if when you went to college, your kids go to college, and your kids miss a class, you just miss a class. And maybe you waste a little bit of money, that's it. If a person under our program doesn't go to class, they go to jail because of the violation of their probation. Democrats already are calling attention to comments that you've made over the years on crime and poverty. For example, you wrote an op-ed in 2015 where you called the issue of homicides involving people with prior felony convictions a self-cleaning oven. How do you expect to represent all people of Indianapolis with past comments like that? Easy. I'm a, I was a talk, I'm a talk show host. I mean, that was my job. My job is to provoke people to think. And also, when I teach college, that's what I tell my students do, critical thinking. And so when I made statements like the self clean oven, it's to get you to think, like, okay, is Abdul crazy or is this actually a good idea? Because in a nutshell, here's what I was saying. Oh, just to give you guys sort of an idea what the story was, um, it was like, I noticed that uh, when, when IMPD would send out uh, news releases, like, hey, this person was murdered, there'd be a mugshot attached. I always thought that mugshot was the suspect. Turns out that mugshot was the victim because that was usually the only picture that anybody had uh, of the victim was a mugshot. And so I went and did some research, like, wait a second, this is bad guy shooting bad guy. Because like I said, 80, 70, 80% of the victims and suspects all had prior adult felonies. Now, does somebody deserve to die? No. However, I, I can't get upset when bad guy shoots bad guy. That's one less bad guy that we have to worry about and we have to deal with. Now, when bad guy shoots at bad guy and hits an innocent person in the middle, that's where I have a problem. It's a little kid who's sitting in their living room watching TV or playing video games and a bullet comes through the window and hits them. If the bad guys want to kill each other and they can do it peacefully, go right ahead. We will, we will not miss you. However, innocent people, those are the ones who need to be protected. Do you regret any of your past social media posts? Nope. Why? I wrote it. <laughs> and I wrote it for a reason. And I always write things thinking that my, my grandmother, had she been alive, would read it. And so would it, would it offend her sensibilities. How do you plan to fix the pothole problem? A couple of things. Number one, obviously we're asking the state for more 
money and the state of Indiana is kind of working through that. One thing I would look at is almost sort of creating like a road TIF district. For example, take a penny of the sales tax that's collected from gas stations and basically draw a square around it, and then that penny from that gas sale of gasoline, gas, from that sale of, gallon, of a gallon of gas would go towards repairing the roads, repairing the potholes, fixing sidewalks. And so in a nutshell, let's say the, the gas station at Easton, Alabama, right down that neck of the woods, basically draw, draw a square, and then all the, the, a penny from those transactions would go toward repairing those roads, fixing the potholes, you know, getting good asphalt, and that sort of thing. Now, how we do it, you know, whether it's whether the state allows it or a tax increase, that we still have to work out remains to be seen. But that's one of the things I would do to help fix our road infrastructure problem. There are at least three Republicans running in this primary. What sets you apart in this field? I would say my experience. Uh, my experience as a radio talk show host, as a college professor, and even to a certain degree as an actor, as a comedian, is being able to effectively communicate with, with the voters, you know, spell out a vision, put together a good team, and carry it out. And I think I can do that uh, probably a little bit better than my colleagues or competitors in the primary. All right, we'll see what happens there. Coming up, state lawmakers debate big changes to Indiana's public health departments. We take you inside the debate over expanding services in exchange for more money. All right, welcome back. State lawmakers are working on major changes to the state's public health system. A Senate panel unanimously approved a measure to provide more funding to public health departments that agreed to provide a set number of services. Critics, including some members of the panel, say the bill needs stronger safeguards for local control. Here's some of that testimony. Many of you have, have heard me talk about how Indiana's life expectancy has been decreasing since 2010. It's now nearly two years below the national average, ranking us 40th in the nation. This decline is occurring in our working age Hoosiers, our Hoosiers that are ages 25 to 64. Individuals, we would hope, are starting their families, establishing their livelihoods, uh, and setting down roots in Indiana. The core services definition in this bill reflects their work and for the most part includes activities that are already required in statute, such as food protection, child-led case management, communicable disease prevention, fatality review teams, and vital records like birth and death certificates. We also included a few new, new services to address issues that are important to our state. In select locations, some of these services are already being provided by local health departments if resources allow. But those areas are often the exception and the need for these services are universal. These services include tobacco prevention and cessation, trauma and injury prevention, maternal child health, partnership with schools to support student health and access to free health screenings for the general public, public and then linkage to care. For counties that choose to opt in to the additional funding, the local health department will be responsible for ensuring that these services are available in their community, either provided directly by the local health department or through partnerships with local partners such as a community health clinic, a not-for-profit organization, etc. The need for these additional services is clear. Although Indiana consistently has been in the top five or six tobacco use states in the nation, in the 2021 Youth Risk Behavior Survey, almost 20% of our ninth through 12th graders are vaping or smoking. Only 39 of our 92 counties have a prevention and cessation program for tobacco. The number and rate of death in every age group for overdose and suicide went up from 2020 to 2021 based on our death certificate data. Public health needs to ensure access to harm reduction programs, connection to peer recovery coach, coaches across our state, and connection to care to address the underlying mental health addiction issues in our state and to help prevent these issues by addressing risk factors, which we know can lead to these complications. We can achieve results when we address these gaps from, to form local partnerships. For example, in maternal child health, expanding our work with EMS across the state to address safe sleep or unsafe sleep for infants when they see this in the homes that they are entering. Ensuring that families identified in schools are aware of the Indiana branch of the American Academy Pediatrics Navigator Program to help connect them to behavioral health services across our state. And assisting with statutorily required screening for, for children through the schools to ensure that they are being completed are just a few of the areas in which we can support women and children across our state. 
and working with hospital or healthcare systems like our federally qualified health clinics, our community health clinics, so we can provide free screenings for the community, checking cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugars, and then providing counseling and referrals if needed, and they're already connected to the FQHC or the community health clinic or the hospital system. I got up and asked the question, what strings are attached to this money? And they conveniently diverted from that and wouldn't answer. So, uh, I'm aware that the Governor's Public Health Commission states that, the, that uh, the may require counties to opt in to the program to comply with the state's health department guidelines rather than let local elected leaders determine what state guidance to follow. Many details are missing in this bill, which concerns us, like which rules counties must follow if they opt in and what rules or strings that the state may add to the agreement later. And it's clear from commission meetings that, or commission hearings rather, that there was a bit of levity in during these meetings if you watch it, and, and there was a sense of retribution that um, may uh, occur for those counties who don't opt in, and um, the levity goes to that, well, we'll get them to come sooner or later because of, of the, uh, the, the draw of the money and, and the connections there. Indiana has a decentralized system that leaves counties, for the most part, in control of their own health departments, as long as we are meeting our statutory duties. The flexibility is ideal. Every county has a different health care needs, and let's keep the county elected officials accountable and not shift that onus to unelected health officials at the state level. I would prefer the state to provide grants on a topic-by-topic -topic basis with local control on whether to accept the grant or not and, and how we handle that. Guidance, not mandates from the state. After the COVID destructive mandates which masked kids, hobbled the economy, stunted education, and crushed mental health, we now want to increase the influence of this state health bureaucracy with an expensive plan designed to centralize more power at the state level no, this is not what we need. The condescending tone of the Health Commission meetings towards county elected officials, in combination with the fact that the state still does not acknowledge the damage it did with its COVID orders, should give Indiana legislators pause when determining whether to fund this outlandish request. Thank you. All right, coming up, major election announcements and a renewed call for police reform. Our panel sifts through another week of big headlines. Take all Indiana politics on the go with you. Download our podcast now. Part of the All Indiana Podcast Network and allindianapodcastnetwork.com. And welcome back to All Indiana Politics on this Sunday morning as we welcome back two members of Indiana's best political team, Democrat Kip Two and Republican Whitley Yates. Good to see you both. Let's begin with major developments in the 2024 Senate race this weekend. Former Governor Mitch Daniels and Congresswoman Victoria Sparts both announced they will not be running for Senate. Sparts getting out of politics completely. Whitley, does this effectively hand the primary to Congressman Jim Banks, in your opinion? Well, I mean, I think the primary is already at this point because no one else uh, has stated that they've run or came out saying that they're going to run specifically on the Republican side. And so I think what this is doing is basically allowing him to kind of have a clear feel of who any opposition would or wouldn't be. So Kip, does the endorsement though of banks by former President Donald Trump provide an opening for Democrats? In my judgment, it does. Uh, but you know, two years is a long time. I would just add uh, add on to say that I think it is a field fair, fairly clear now for Jim Banks. It looks like he's out all by himself, but it's a long way till those, uh, we got a whole year before somebody has to file for the, that race. So a lot of things could change. A lot of things could happen in that year, but he clearly is the, the big front runner. And he's gotten not only the Trump endorsement, but he's run around the state getting as many endorsements as he can. The one person that didn't endorse him, though, was Mitch Daniels, which I found particularly interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as Kit mentioned, Whitley, we still have a long time. What other Republicans are, he are you hearing that could get into the race? Um, interestingly enough, the ones that we were hearing are no longer mentioned as candidates, but it will be hard for anyone to step into the race after someone's been campaigning for over a year to hold that position building those relationships and garnering that support around the state a year ahead of any type of opponent, I think is a strong advantage. And how long, Kip, do you think we can, 
we can wait before we hear a Democrat jumping in? Well, I think, you know, for a Democrat to be competitive, they're going to have to think hard about this and get in in the, in the next couple of months so they can start to raise the money that it takes to be competitive. So, um, I, you know, I think we've got a little time, but not a lot. The, the other thing I would say is that, uh, you know, right now there's not a clear front runner on our side. There's not been anybody uh, except for Keith Potts to express interest in that Senate race. So uh, you still have a little bit more time while the other person isn't, while there isn't anybody else out there actively campaigning, going and trying to get endorsements. Okay, we'll see what happens. In other news that I want to get to, activists and some members of Congress are again calling for national police reform. This, of course, after five Memphis police officers beat Tyree Nichols to death. Kip, is there any chance something like this gets done through this Congress? Um, uh, you know, probably not. Uh, I try to remain hopeful uh, with a divided Congress, the ability for them to agree uh, you know, Democrats and Republicans to come together and agree on something is seems remote uh, if you look at it from an objective standpoint. But there's no doubt, I think, there is consensus in the United States that we need to have uh, police officers who don't engage in murder um, and that we hire the right kind of folks to um, protect us, but also uh, to be understanding of what they're walking into. It's, I'm not trying to diminish the very difficult job that police officers have. It's a harrowing job. There are first responders. It's a difficult thing uh, to have to do, but we certainly don't want the kind of officers that just got fired mm -hmm. uh, to have that issue. Whitley, you're shaking your head in agreement. Yeah, so I find it interesting, though, that when the Democrats did have more power than they do now, this also wasn't passed then. When other bills that were proposed, um, specifically from people like Senator Tim Scott, those were not also lauded by uh, the Democratic Party. But I think that what we have to be happy for here in Indiana is that we do have a policing reform bill that was signed about two years ago that bans chokeholds. Um, that teaches and enforces de-escalation training that allows for um, officers, specifically state police, I know Indianapolis is just now getting onto the body cam, um, but that are that have body cams on state police officers. And so these hopefully are not issues that we're going to have to worry about now. Um, Mayor Joe Hofstad um, and, and I am PD in that situation that's happening that we, we're seeing all these different cases. It's going to be something different. But as far as the state is concerned, I think that the legislator has done a great job of being proactive and not retroactive where that's happening in well, this state. Let me just correct her on something. Indianapolis Police Department had body cameras long before the state police did. A no, they ahead. had a trial run of body cameras and said that they didn't have the funds to do the full program. You're just, they, you're just dead wrong. Funds. You then are dead wrong. The funds, IMPD had the had Okay. All right. And you know what? We'll, we'll have to fact check cameras. that. We'll fact check that. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll bring it up again in the future, I'm sure. Uh, other news that I want to get to is President Joe Biden delivering his State of the Union address on Tuesday night. This is his first speech to Congress since Republicans took control of the House. Now, this question is for both of you. Uh, what should we be watching out for in that speech? And Whitley, we'll begin with you here. About a minute left. Yeah, I would say, is the president cognizant of where he is, what he's saying, and his plan to lead this country? I think we've seen time and time again that he hasn't been clear on a path for America. And so we need to hear from him a plan, a path of correction, because our lives are at stake and the quality of lives of Americans are also at stake. Kip, you didn't like that response. Well, it ignores facts on the ground, right? I mean, we've had the strongest recovery since uh, since Donald Trump uh, that we've had in 50 years. I mean, we had 517,000 jobs created in January, upwards revisions of the other ones. We have the lowest unemployment we've had in 50 years in the United States. And inflation is coming down after the pandemic. Coming down I mean, is not our down. Economy, our economy is in strong shape and not it what anybody not. predicted. You know it. Eggs are it up. Is. The cost of gas is All up. Right. The electricity the bills are down. up. Everyone is, everyone is reeling. Right. Rent is not of control. <laughs> Come on, Kent. You know Americans aren't happy right now. Stop talking playing. Over me. You're talking over me, but the you know the United States is in, his be in much right. better shape than they were in All December. Right. You know what? We'll leave it right there. Uh, we'll talk again in the future. Thank you so much. We'll be right back. All right. Good to be with you. And thank you for joining us for All Indiana Politics this week. The State of the Union Address is on Tuesday night at 9 o'clock. You can watch that live here on Wish TV, also on wishtv.com. And we'll be back here next Sunday morning, as always, at 9.30. You can also find our brand new All Indiana Politics podcast. It's part of the All Indiana Podcast Network over at wishtv.com. That's it for us. Have a great rest of your weekend.